All right, so what I wanted to talk today about is um, how we can do some experimental measurements of a lot of these concepts that we've been talking about, or in terms of theory and simulation. I in particular, how we can access information about the these energy landscapes. Um, so as you all know, right, these energy landscape picture provides our our physical basis for understanding what's going on in folding, and we we look at it in terms of a diffusive search over some uh, usually funnel-shaped landscape to find the folded state. So we would start off at a high energy and also high entropy unfolded state, and then slither over the surface diffusively until we eventually end up in that uh, low energy and low entropy folded state. Uh, now, some key points about this is that, first of all, the process is statistical, right? So in principle, there's many pathways that should be explored, uh, and we heard a lot about that last week. Um, second of all, the diffusive motions are not in position space, like three-dimensional space. These are in conformational space, and therefore, because there can be many, many degrees of freedom in even a relatively small molecule, this is a very high-dimensional uh, surface. Uh, even though we, of course, can only represent it uh, at most as like a two-dimensional surface. Okay, now, e from an experimental standpoint, unfortunately, we can't keep track of every single degree of freedom in a molecule. Um, typically, what we do is we have one experimental observable which we follow to tell us about the progress of the folding reaction. So that, that observable is then re related to the, uh, the reaction coordinate, as we call it, and we end up with a a projection of this full multi-dimensional surface onto a free energy profile, a one-dimensional profile that looks like that. Now, my slightly provocative claim is that many aspects of, of the theory of folding really have not been uh, fully validated experimentally. Um, and and that's, that's really because of this, this central challenge here, and that is that, first of all, the, even a one-dimensional energy profile is actually exceptionally difficult to measure experimentally. Um, and so is the diffusion coefficient, which tells you how you're moving over it. Um, so in order to properly validate this theory, we need to be able to do both. We need to uh, first measure the, the a 1D profile. You know, that's, that's okay. We don't need to measure the whole thing, just a, a 1D profile. Um, second of all, we need to measure the diffusion coefficient uh, that connects this landscape to the observed kinetics. And thirdly, we need to check that the, the, the dynamics of the molecules that we're seeing basically match the expectation of diffusion over this profile. Um, and so wha what I'm hoping to show you is that single molecule trajectories measured under tension actually provide a very powerful pr uh, platform for doing this and therefore testing the, the validating the, the basic physics of folding. Uh, okay, so uh, when I talk about measurements under tension, this is the same diagram I showed last week, but in case people there are some new people this week. Um, the basic idea is we take our molecule of interest, we use some kind of a force probe. In this case, I use optical tweezers. Many people use AFM uh, to uh, grab onto the ends of the molecule, apply tension, and then as you increase the tension, at some point your molecule will start to unfold, and because it's under, ten uh, under tension, any part of the molecule that unfolds gets stretched out. So you see a change in the uh, extension of the molecule, and that becomes then your reaction coordinate. And this is actually a very nice reaction coordinate because it has a very natural interpretation in terms of the number of amino acids, if it's a protein, or nucleotides, if it's a nucleic acid, that are unfolded. Um, now, I mentioned we use optical tweezers. Uh, the basic idea behind optical tweezers is quite simple. Uh, you take a laser beam, you very tightly focus it, and then a small dielectric object, like, say, a plastic or glass bead, uh, will be trapped near the focus. Um, you can think of it this way. If I take this bead and move it slightly out off focus like so, that will de bend the laser beam. The photons, of course, carry momentum, so there's a change of momentum. That means the bead is applying a force to the light. The light applies a reaction force to the bead, pushes it back towards the center. And this happens in every direction, so you effectively have a Hookean spring in three dimensions made out of light. It's just a very, very delicate spring with a soft spring constant. Um, and of course, to, to do these measurements, we have to take uh, the speed and then uh, attach it to the molecule of interest via some kind of a linker. And so typically, we're using uh, beads that are a little bit less than a micron in diameter, and then linkers that, in total, are a little bit less than a micron in length. 
All right, the, but if you do this and you are very careful with your, your experimental apparatus, you, the, the advantage this affords you is that it, it can be exquisitely sensitive. So we can measure motions that are as small as an angstrom, uh, and we can measure motions that are as fast as a few, uh, a few microseconds. Uh, so here's just an illustration of, the, uh, of showing angstrom scale steps for a bead that's been trapped. You're just moving it by angstrom steps. Um, and to give you a sense of scale, right, that's the diameter of a hydrogen atom, uh, and here's your width of a DNA helix. So it's, you know, it's goodly, it's a good resolution for seeing what's going on, the details in these molecules. Um, now, of course, this is not uh, straightforward to implement. Here's a picture of, of one of our traps. Um, uh, the, the trapping laser is this thing right here. It's in the infrared. Uh, we split it up into two by polarization. It goes through some fancy crystals to manipulate the beam in various in the two axes of the plane. Uh, and then it recombines. It gets sent into this inverted microscope. We got a second beam, which is at a different wavelength, which we use to, which we, which we uh, uh, align very precisely on top of the trapping beam. And we scatter that off of the beads, and we use that to that beam gets sent into the separated up by um, polarization and sent to position sensitive detectors so we can tell where our beads are. Um, and uh, so, so the, the length scale that we're interested in, one amino acid for a protein is um, 3.6 nanometers, uh, 3.6 angstroms. So you know, one angstrom is good for, for telling that. The time scales we're interested in are from about a microsecond up to um, you know, tens of minutes for something that's really slow. So we can't quite get down to one microsecond, but we cover most of that range. We can definitely get up to a thousand seconds. Um, yeah, so, all right, what can we do with this? Well, uh, this is just to, again, repeating what I showed uh, last week. Um, we one of the classic measurement types is to move the traps apart at a constant speed and then bring them back. So you ramp up the force and then ramp it back down and you stretch out your handles, and at some point your protein unfolds. In this case, we're, I'm showing you data from the protein PRP, which causes my cat disease. And then you can bring it back, and it refolds, and there's a little bit of hysteresis here, because this is a non-equilibrium measurement. And we can do it lots of times, um, and fit the shapes of these curves to worm-like chain polymer theory to figure out exactly what the length was that was unfolded. And we can look at the force, the distribution of forces that, that come out of that. Then the second type of measurement we do, where this is non-equilibrium, we can do a measurement in equilibrium where we pull it out to some force like around 10 piganewtons or 9 piganewtons where it hops back and forth in equilibrium between these two states that it can coexist in. That looks like this, where you get the high extension means that it's unfolded and the low extension means that it's folded. Uh, and then you can change the force so that you can change how much of the unfolded versus folded state you see. Okay, so these are the kinds of measurements. There's a third type of measurement that uh, is sometimes used, especially in AFM. I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, just these two. All right, so what I'd like to do is go through these three points. First of all, how we can measure these uh, energy profiles. Um, second of all, how we can figure out diffusion coefficients. And lastly, um, what we can learn by looking at transition paths, which actually end up combining both of those. And then putting this all together to to make some quantitative tests of, of the theory of folding. All right, so let's first look at, at uh, how to measure landscapes. And, and uh, one of the advantages of force spectroscopy is that there are actually several different independent ways of reconstructing um, these landscapes. So you can try and make sure that you're not looking at experimental artifacts by doing it in different types of measurements. So perhaps, well, Okay, a very, perhaps the most widely used, and certainly it's very widely used method, is, is this theory uh, the, that Olga talked about, for example, last week, where you look at the distribution of the forces in these unfolding curves. Um, and, uh, and then you use a model-dependent approach to reconstruct the key parameters that end up defining the overall shape of the landscape. Um, so that idea is illustrated here. You've got some stable molecule. Uh, at zero force, the barrier is pretty high. You're not likely to uh, escape over it, but uh, applying force tilts that landscape. Uh, and so your barrier comes down. It actually also moves slightly, and that has, an, has, has a, a subtle but, a, uh, but detectable influence on, on what happens. 
Um, and at some point, you'll it'll be low enough that you'll get thermal fluctuations that take you over. And as you keep on lowering, you get more and more. And so you get this pattern of the distribution of unfolded forces that uh, can be written out analytically for certain classes of landscape profiles. And this is what you get for a linear cubic profile. Um, so you can just take your data. You can make a histogram out of it and then fit it to the theory. You can do this lots and lots of times um, and pull out these three numbers. So this is telling you the kinetics. And then these two numbers together implicitly define the shape of that landscape. So this is very nice. It's actually fairly straightforward to do, which is the great thing about it. Uh, the one downside is that it is model dependent, right? I've assumed that it's got a linear cubic form. And we don't actually know a priori that this is true. So it would be nice to have a method that does not depend on making assumptions about the underlying shape. Uh, so what can we do for that? Well, one, perhaps the, like the conceptually the simplest approach <coughs> is to go back to these equilibrium measurements where I'm just hopping back and forth between all the available states um, and use simple Boltzmann statistics, right? The probability that I'm going to be at any given extension should just be proportional to the Boltzmann factor. Um, so here I'm showing you data not for the prion protein, but for a, a DNA hairpin. This is one of our favorite molecules, so you'll see it reappearing, reappearing a lot. Um, so the idea here is we just take a lot of these, in fact, a few thousand, um, and you build up a beautiful distribution. Uh, and then we just invert this. And then you say, yay, we're done. But unfortunately, you have to actually realize that we're not done yet. It's not quite so simple. And the problem is that, OK, first of all, you have this challenge that actually getting enough uh, transitions so you get good data in the part where it spends almost no time is, is, is you know, this is hard to do. But there's a, 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 a a more fundamental problem, and that is that the geometry of the experiment actually affects our, our measurement. Right? These, these peaks here are actually broadened by the compliance of this. You know, we've got this linker is like an elastic band. So it has a lot of compliance. And even if I had something of definite length like this, where there's no, there's no hairpin molecule in between, it's just double-stranded DNA, if I was to measure this, this I'd get a Gaussian distribution like that. OK, so this is telling me my point spread function of the instrument. Now, of course, I can measure this, which means then that I can deconvolve. Right? Um, so we can remove the smoothing by a deconvolution method. Um, and so here I, I illustrate this for two hairpins of, of different sequence. This one actually has a little mismatch in it, which introduces an intermediate state. Um, so here's just the raw probability distribution and the energy profile you get from without any deconvolution. Uh, but after deconvolution, you can see it it uh, sharpens it up considerably by about a factor of three or four. Um, and the resulting profile looks like that in red. And you can see that this, this, this little state here, which was barely visible in the undeconvolved uh, data, is now quite, quite clear and gives rise to a, an, extra, an extra well. Now, the reason we did this with hairpins is because other people have done enough measurements of the biochemical and biophysical properties that we can make a model of what we expect to see where every single parameter has been measured by someone else and just compare it. And that's in blue. So there's no fitting, no nothing. It's just straight up comparison. And it agrees really very nicely. So this is telling us that this method does, in fact, work quite well. Um, and we did an empirical approach to the deconvolution. Um, um, the Thurumalized group uh, developed a, a more theoretical treatment for, uh, of the mechanical network of this, of this measurement to, to, so you could do a theoretical deconvolution. Now, this is great, but there's a problem, and that is that you have to get good hopping data. And it's often, for many molecules, this is not possible because the barrier is too high. Uh, and you would have to wait too long. So it becomes very impractical to do this. So often you only have these non-equilibrium measurements as the possibility. Um, so it would be nice to have a model-independent way of reconstructing profiles, energy profiles from the non-equilibrium data. Uh, and we can do this. There is a method. Uh, and it's based on the Jarzinski equality that relates free energies to non-equilibrium works. Uh, so, of course, you know, these pulling curves that I was showing you earlier, it's force versus a distance. If I integrate that, I get a work, right? 
uh, unfortunately, because it's out of equilibrium, right, I'm having the energy that's dissipated, so my average work is going to be greater than or equal to the free, uh, free energy change. However, if you know the distribution of works, you can actually recover the equilibrium free energy. The basic idea is shown here. Let's suppose that's my average work and that's my actual uh, free energy change. If I can find a, if I can find a some way of weighting the average so that I give a lot of weight to this tail here and very little to this, the bulk of the distribution, then maybe I can get back the right number. And Jarzinski showed that this was a very simple expression. It's just the average of a an exponential weighting. And then um, Gerhard Hummer and uh, Tilosavo showed how they could extend this to calculate this um, profile. Uh, so we decided we needed to validate this experimentally, experimentally uh, by comparing the result you get from this method to the one we got from this inverse Boltzmann method. Um, so here's that same uh, pot hairpin that we like so much and then another one that we also like a lot. And several different reconstructions from different sets of measurements at different pulling speeds. Uh, and then we plot on top of that the equilibrium result, and you can see it agrees res really quite well. Uh, although we still have to remove the smoothing effects from the handles, right? They're still present. Okay, uh, so this is applying it to hairpins. Now maybe we can go back to our uh, PRP and see how well was our, how well does this profile that we measure from the model independent way, how, does, how well does that agree with the profile we assumed when we were doing the model dependent analysis that I was showing you earlier? Um, so we go to the same data that we used in that other analysis, and we apply the hammer zabo method. This time we actually do take care of the handle, so we do the deconvolution, uh, and this is the profile you get at zero force, and then that is the linear cubic profile that was implied by those fitting results. So it's telling us that that actually it was a quite a reasonable assumption for the underlying shape. All right, now um, the original Hammer-Sabo method is based on a weighted histogram analysis, um, and it turns out that uh, sometimes when you're doing these measurements, okay, so you need to have enough data at, at every value of the extension in order to do this reliably. Um, and in, in some measurements, they were, like, like in this paper here, where they're looking at Titan, which has a nice big grip. Um, they weren't getting enough data in order to reconstruct the landscape in the part that you care about. Um, so sometimes it's not just not feasible to obtain enough data to do this method. Uh, and so then there's a variation um, that, uh, again, uh, Attila and Gerhard came up with, where instead of calculating the free energy of the system as a function of the extension, which is our reaction coordinate, you calculate it first as a function of the control variable, which is the position of your traps, of your probe. Uh, and then you do a transform to transform that into the, the reaction coordinate, which is, of course, what you care about. So we basically applied this to that exact same hairpin again. So now we've got three methods. Uh, and they, so the blue is that original um, inverting the Boltzmann equation. The black is our weighted histogram approach, and then the red is this new inverse Weierstrass approach. Uh, and you can see they all agree quite nicely. However, there's a slight deviation in the barrier. The barrier seems to be depressed in this inverse uh, Weierstrass transform. And, and this is actually ends up being important. This is because the Weierstrass transform itself filters the landscape uh, by an amount that's equivalent to the stiffness of the probe of the force probe. Um, so, in fact, we can show this by um, decreasing the stiffness of our trap and redoing the measurements and redoing the reconstruction. And this is just showing you the stiffness of, of this barrier is actually higher than the stiffness of the trap, which is in, is in brown. Um, and if we decrease the stiffness of the trap, you can see it pushes that barrier down even more and so it matches the stiffness of the trap. It's you know, not a huge effect here. It's no definitely noticeable, but not gigantic. A case where it's very much more noticeable is a, a different molecule, in this case an RNA pseudonaut, uh, where the barrier is much sharper. Uh, and at our, you know, the best we were able to do looks like that, and it's clearly not giving you a very good, a, a very good representation of the barrier. So this is, this is sort of an object lesson in needing to take care to account for the properties of your instrument to make sure that you're not generating artifacts when you apply some method. Uh, 
but it's also what it's just telling you is that this, is, this method is particularly well suited to some probe that's got very high stiffness, like AFM, right? Because they're very stiff probes, typically an order of magnitude or more stiffer than, than optical traps. All right, the last method I wanted to talk about is based on a different approach, and it's based actually on looking at this uh, splitting probability, p-fold, which tells you the probability to reach the folded state before the unfolded state starting at some given value of your reaction coordinate. So if you think of a simple two-state well like so, if I start off right at the top of the barrier, I should be equally likely to go either direction, so my p-fold should be half. If I start off on this side, I'm far more likely to slide down to the folded state before I go over the barrier, so people will be closer to one, on, and vice versa on this side, so it'll be closer to zero. Um, now, for a diffusive system, um, I, you can actually calculate the, you can relate this people to the shape of that landscape. This is done under the here under the assumption of a constant diffusion coefficient, um, so you get this expression here. But of course, I can also calculate this empirically from a trajectory, right? Um, I just go through, pick a, an extension, say, okay, every time I cross there, do I end up folded first or unfolded? And I calculate the probability. So this means that I actually know this number. Uh, so I can just differentiate and pull out uh, the, the profile. Um, and just to demonstrate this on our favorite hairpin again, um, so that I can compare it to all these other methods that we know are all self-consistent. Um, this is what our splitting probability looks like. The profile you get from that looks like so, and then comparing it to the deconvolved uh, inverse Boltzmann profile, you see that it gets the barrier at the right place, it's the right shape. It's a little noisier, but you know, that's experimental. Uh, so we can do this for another hairpin with a different sequence and a barrier that's in a different location, and again, it agrees very nicely. And in fact, the interesting thing about this approach is that it's capturing the barrier height and location and shape without having to worry about deconvolution. Because it turns out that this statistic is less sensitive to the compliance of our instrument. All right, so now we have multiple different ways of getting a, a, an energy profile. Um, let's have a look at diffusion coefficients. So uh, if we know the shape of the profile, right, and we know the rate for going over it, then we can apply something like Cromer's theory. Uh, because we have all of you know, we have these we have these stiffnesses we have that barrier height so and we have that so we can just solve for for d um, and of course this diffusion coefficient is very interesting because it's basically telling you like what's the uh, time scale for the microscopic motions right um, and it ends up producing this folding speed limit and how it tells you something about internal friction in the protein etc um, so it is actually very interesting uh, so we can take say, our favorite hairpin. Um, I've already shown you how we have multiple ways of getting the profile, so all we need is the rate. We can pull that off very straightforwardly. We just figure out, okay, when is it in the folded state, when is it in the unfolded, sorry, when is it in the folded state, when is it in the unfolded state, build a distribution of lifetimes. Uh, it's there single exponentially uh, distributed, and you pull out the rate, right? That's the, the exponential fitting factor. Um, so we can just go to our profile, fit, to the quadratic and the, the barrier and the two wells, uh, we can actually right. So we can actually solve Cramer's theory for going the Cramer's equation going for unfolding as well as for folding to make sure that everything is consistent, right? Because I like should get the same diffusion coefficient back. Um, and when you do this, it all works out very nicely, uh, and you get this number here: um, four times ten to the five nanometers squared per second. Now. The one issue is that it's actually extremely hard to measure these diffusion coefficients, and so there's no other really nice direct measurement of this. Uh, but the value, the value for a diffusion coefficient have been sorry, inferred from modeling um, some fluorescence measurements. Uh, so there's a couple of papers that had looked at this, and they got, uh, for a hairpin, they got something like 10 to the 5, and for unfolded single-stranded uh, DNA, they got something like 10 to the 7. So it's within that range, which is at least uh, consistent. Of course, a hairpin is not as interesting as a protein, so we can do this for our proteins too. So for PRP, we's, we've in fact used both the model-dependent method and the model-independent method, right? So we can compare the results from those two reconstructions. Uh, for the model-dependent method, we just plug the uh, quantities, the fitting parameters into this equation, 
for the model independent method, we can actually do something a little fancier. We can take our landscape, we can tilt it to all the forces we've got measurements of the rates at, and then we can remeasure the barrier heights for unfolding and for refolding and the curvatures of all those states um, and use D as a single fitting parameter for a global fit for all the data. Uh, and you get these, these lines here for folding and unfolding, and you can see it fits reasonably well. Um, and the number you pull out after all is said and done is roughly 10 to the 6 by that time, um, uh, nanometer squared per second. And again, there's actually no, in this case, there's no previous measurements for the diffusion coefficient going over the barrier, right? People have measured the diffusion of unfolded or unstructured uh, peptides and proteins. Uh, but that's not quite the same thing because of there is expected to be some position dependence. And it's, in fact, expected to become slightly slower as you, as you go move towards the folded state. Uh, and so, in fact, this is about an order of magnitude or two slower than these numbers you get from the unfolded protein, so this is all this all makes sense. Um, interestingly, you'll, see, you'll notice that I've projected this, I've extrapolated it back to zero for us. Now there are rate measurements from biochemical assays of folding, of PRP, uh, and that's where they show up. Um, so there's actually pretty good agreement here. Uh, and in, in some sense, you can look at this as a, a test of the predictive ability, right? Here, we, what we've, of, of theory of you know, the landscape theory of protein folding. Here we've measured a landscape, we've measured a diffusion coefficient, and then we change the landscape, in this case by force, and we say, well, what should the rate be? And it actually agrees pretty nicely. Um, so this is like a, a first quantitative test of the predictive power. Uh, okay, now here I was looking at, at the native folding of PRP, and as I mentioned last week, our lab is particularly interested in non-native folding, so misfolding and aggregation. Um, and so we were interested in looking at how diffusion coefficients might differ in the context of misfolding and aggregation. Um, so we've looked at this now in two systems. Uh, one is uh, PRP, which I talked about last week, so I'll just really briefly cover it. And the other one is an intrinsically disordered protein, in this case, um, alpha-synuclein, which is associated with Parkinson's disease. So. For PRP, when we take two, just to remind you of what I talked about last week, when we take two PRPs and stick them together so they make a tandem dimer, they form this uh, misfolded dimer whose structure we don't know, uh, but they form it reliably. You never see the native structure. Uh, and it has multiple e intermediates, so you can identify several different uh, misfolding transitions. Um, and we can uh, do this kind of analysis I was talking about before, where you look at the force distributions and you fit those to the um, to the, the theory that Olga put together, and you pull out the diffusion coefficient. And when you do that, uh, you get basically the same result for each of these transitions. It's, it's about uh, 10 to the 3 nanometers squared per second, rather than 10 to the 6, which I just showed you for, for native folding of PRP. So it's a 1,000 times slower. Um, and you know, presumably, this is because the landscape is rougher, because we've got extra friction happening from all these non-native contacts that are, that are involved. And there's been, of course, no evolutionary selection to make the folding good and fast because this is a misfolded state that presumably we, there's no selection for. All right, turning to alpha-synuclein, this, this presents an interesting problem because it's a disordered protein. Um, and that actually makes it quite challenging to stru uh, characterize structurally. So in vitro, it's largely disordered. If you look at the CD, there's not much structure there. Um, NMR suggests that there are definitely long-range contacts present, but they don't seem to give rise to secondary structure. However, in, the, uh, in various different contexts, if you change its, its, its um, solution conditions, it can take on a variety of different structures. So for example, it'll bind to membranes and form various types of helical structures. Um, if you take it down to low pH, it will gain beta sheet um, content and it goes into amyloid fibers, and uh, there's now at least two different structures that have been found. Um, this one most recently for supposedly infectious fibers, and this one in just uh, um, in vitro um, uh, uh, fibers made in vitro. At any rate, regardless the, of the details, the key point here is that uh, structural heterogeneity and fluctuations are or the order of the day. Um, now, it is disordered, so most of the time, we, if we put this in a trap and pull on it, we would expect to see not much of anything. Um, and indeed, that's what's happened. Uh, so here, what we've done is this, each yellow blob, it represents one 
uh, domain of alpha synuclein. So we've got a monomer, we have a tandem dimer, and then we have a tandem tetramer. And about 70 to 80 percent of the pulls, I'm not going to talk about the ones where we do see structure because that's a whole different story, but about 70 to 80 percent of the time uh, we see these things that have no discrete rips on them, uh, but there looks like there might be something subtle going on. Um, so in fact, when you fit these to a Wormlike chain, which you should have for a non-interacting polymer, you do in fact see some subtle variations that get bigger as you have more alpha nucleins present. Um, so what this and, and those these deviations are not present when the handle only is there. Okay, so they're coming from the protein. Um, so this is telling us that some interactions are making the protein more compact than expected, and and this is perhaps not unexpected, right? Because there's this result from the NMR study saying that there are long-range contacts that compactify it, and there's been su suggested to go into some kind of compact coil or molten globule-like state that just doesn't have any secondary structure. Uh, and anyway, so we can analyze this further. Um, it turns out that this shoulder feature uh, is, in fact, in, is totally reversible. So the unfolding and refolding curves lie on top of each other. So it's, it's in equilibrium. Uh, and it's happening at low force. So this is telling us that the reversibility tells us that it's fluctuating rapidly between structures. Um, and then the low force tells us that they can't be terribly stable. All right, so we can try and model this. Uh, and the minimal model we can use here is some collection of independently fluctuating two-state systems. Um, so, you know, maybe you have a, a sheet-like thing here, and a, I mean a, hair, a beta hairpin-like thing there, and maybe a little helix there, and they're all independent. They can come and go and very fast. Uh, and so we can assume that there might be several different classes of these and basically see how many, how much, how much stuff do we need to add in, in in order to account for the data that we see. Um, and each transition is characterized by two parameters, the length change during the transition and the force at which it spends half of its time unfolding. Um, and to you know, preserve generality, every class, I mean, we, we, a, a single class could have multiple structures that all have the same properties. We can't really tell. Okay, so we can basically go to our, our pools. We can average them to average away some of the noise. Um, there's the residual we see, and we're, we're dropping off the monomer because it turns out that the the signal is sufficiently small that we can't really do anything with it statistically. Um, but you can see that there is a, a definite and systematic residual uh, in the dimer and tetramer data, and it's twice as big in the dimer in the tetramer as it is in the dimer, which is what we'd expect from this, this effect. Um, and we tried various combinations of models, and the best fit we got was um, two distinct types of transitions. Uh, and uh, the key thing is here, first of all, you can see the forces are low, which, which makes sense. And these energies, they're like 1 to 2 kT. It's like barely stable. Um, now, if this is true, if this picture is true, and we've got rapid, lots of rapid fluctuations, we should be able to go into these curves and sort of sit on the shoulder and see, um, you know, even if we can't see discrete transitions, we should see the effects of these fluctuations by looking at, say, the autocorrelation of, the, of our signal here. Um, so we can do this. We can compare at a part of the curve that doesn't have any, wh 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 that shouldn't have any of these structures. They should all be unfolded, say. Um, and in fact, when you do that, you see the autocorrelation of the extension is the same for just the handles and beads, or handles and beads plus protein. So the protein is not doing anything extra. And the time scale you get here, uh, the decay time there is 50 microseconds, which we had separately shown is actually the time scale for the bead and handle motion under these conditions. Uh, but if you go to on the shoulder, the handles still look the same right? the, if you just do handle only measurements. But the protein now has an extra time constant. So there, you know, I there is indeed some extra dynamics there. <laughs> and we can do this, we can do these measurements at various different forces and then pull out the microscopic rates using that model that we had of the two different classes. And when we do that, we get force-dependent rates that look like this. And then we can fit this to Olga's model right, for the landscape and pull out the landscape parameters, and you end up with something that looks like this, where the, you know, everything is on a fairly small energy scale. These rates you see are very high. This is good. They should be, right, because it's fluctuating very rapidly, so the picture is all self-consistent. And so we can recover the diffusion coefficient in the same way I showed you for PRP. Uh, and we get a number that's about 5 times 10 to the 4. 
So it's still actually quite slow compared to what you get for a, you know, an unfolded, a fully unfolded protein. Um, and it's still slow compared to the native folding of PRP. Though it's a little faster than the misfolding of PRP. Um, so we can pull out what's the implied landscape roughness from Swansig's theory is roughly 2 kp, uh, which interestingly enough is about the size of the stability right, of these structures. So the picture that you get is, is that this landscape is you know, relatively flat but rough, and the roughness, this microscopic roughness, is roughly the same scale as the uh, variations in the landscape as you go from one state to another. Okay. Um, so with that, I'd like to move on to the third part, which is uh, looking at um, transition paths, which allows us to explore many of these same ideas. So uh, just a reminder, transition paths are the brief part of the trajectory where you actually go over this energy barrier. Um, and this is the most interesting part of the, of the folding because that's where all of the uh, key things are happening. So it tells all of the, it tells you all, it contains all the critical information about mechanisms. Because, uh, you know, you're sitting down here and most of the time you're just bouncing around with thermal fluctuations. Okay, now, experimentally, these are extremely difficult to observe. Uh, there's several challenges. First of all, you can't, you can't see them in ensemble measurements uh, because there's no way to synchronize all the molecules to start folding at the same time. Right? So you have to look at it in a single molecule. Um, second thing is, and this is somewhat subtle, but because they, they don't last, they, they have a very short duration compared to how long they stay, the molecule stays in the folded state or the unfolded state, you need a, a measurement with an extremely wide bandwidth, uh, um, sorry, dynamic range. Uh, so you have to be able to see stuff that's happening very fast, but measure for an extremely long time so you actually get to that. And that ends up being not so, not so si straightforward. Um, and we can understand why you have these disparate time scales because, of course, uh, the lifetime is determined mainly by waiting for to get enough energy from a thermal fluctuation to take you get you over that barrier. But once you have that energy, uh, going over is basically just determined by the friction coefficient, so your diffusion coefficient. All right. Now the pioneering measurements on this were done by um, by Bill Eaton's group. Uh, where they were able to pull out the average time that it takes to go over these transition paths, and they were doing this with single molecule FRET. So they just take a, a protein attached to fluorophores that can um, exchange energy, and they'd attach them to a surface and watch them. And here's a typical trajectory. And in f wh when you're making FRET trajectories, so trajectories of the, of the FRET efficiency, unfortunately you have to bin your data, right? You need enough photons in each channel so you can get a ratio. Um, and typically, the problem is that the transition takes place in one bin. Uh, so what they did here was they uh, applied a clever maximum likelihood uh, estimate method and lo just looked at the photon arrival times to figure out how long this took. And so they were able to, from the, the peak of this uh, likelihood function here, uh, get an estimate of the average time. Um, and they did this for a few different proteins. Uh, and they also try to a DNA hairpin. And the numbers they're getting are all in the range of like 1 to 10 microseconds. So fairly fast. And the problem with this is that they, they can't actually see the path itself, right? Because the path is happening in between those two points. Um, and so we took the approach of using um, uh, force spectroscopy. Now, our original attempt, we didn't have enough time resolution, so we had the same problem that it was all happening within two or three points, and it was just not enough to actually define the shape. However, by going to very stiff traps and improving our system a little bit, we were able to get our time resolution down to about six to 10 microseconds, depending on the conditions. Um, and now when we, when we zoom into one of these transitions, you can actually get several data points, so you can see what it's doing. Um, so, and of course, you, know, you can see even from this short, uh, this short snippet of a, of, a, of a trajectory, you get lots of transitions, in fact, for this particular hairpin, we have over 50, around 50,000. I think it's over 50,000 now. Uh, and so you can have a look at all of these different transitions, and you see a very wide variety of, of behaviors, uh, which is clearly encoding in hu a huge amount of information. So we can see some that are very fast, some that are quite slow. Uh, you see some that have like distinct local variations in speed. It starts off slow, and then it goes fast. 
Um, you get transient pauses, like here, we're just sort of hanging out for a few microseconds at one extension. Um, and then you can see places where it's sort of shuffling back and forth and back and forth, uh, which is really like a nice direct demonstration of this diffusive motion that should be there. Okay, so the first thing we looked at, I'm not going to have time to go through everything we've looked at, but the first thing we looked at was measuring, just returning to this question of the time. How long does it take to get across the, 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 um, the, the barrier? Because this actually allows us to test these diffu diffusive theories of folding. And so we can do this, we don't, we, you know, we don't have to use some fancy statistical uh, estimator. We can just measure it directly from the trace. We define boundaries for our, our, our barrier region, which for convenience we just take as, as the middle half of the distance between the folded and unfolded states. Then we just measure from directly from the trace the time that it, it takes to get between one to the other. Uh, and so you can put together a distribution. So this is a distribution for one of our molecules uh, for unfolding. Uh, and then for refolding, it looks like that in green. And you can see it's basically the same with an experimental error, which makes sense because it should be time reversal symmetric. Um, and now we can, for example, find out what's the average value. In this case, it's 28 microseconds. And we can actually compare this to that theory from Attila Sabo that, uh, that was talked about in the previous section. session. Um, so if you have a harmonic, a 1D harmonic uh, barrier, um, this average time should be given by that expression there. Uh, so you need, to know the, you, know, you need to know the barrier height, you need to know the barrier curvature, but we have those from our landscape reconstructions. And, so this and, and we have previously for this hairpin, I sh already showed you how we got the diffusion coefficient from Cromer's theory. So we can just plug all those numbers in and see what we get for that. And in fact, okay, so that's all the ways we've reconstructed the landscape. Just, you know, we've got lots of ways. Uh, the result you get is 31 microseconds. So it agrees very nicely with, with the direct measurement. So this basically validates that equation experimentally. But of course, we get more than the average, right? We get this distribution. And uh, so some theorists have worked out what the shape of that distribution should be, again, for a harmonic uh, one-dimensional barrier. Um, and so we can fit that, and it actually fits really quite nicely. Um, and the interesting thing about this fit is that this um, coefficient here, omega k, which defines the, um, the exponential decay, that actually gives us the diffusion coefficient. So we have yet another measure of the diffusion coefficient. Uh, in this case, we're getting 2 times 10 to the 5. Um, and in fact, you know, now we have several independent ways of getting at the diffusion coefficient. So we can see if these different ways, which are all determined from actually physically independent quantities, whether they agree. Uh, so from the distribution of individual times, we get uh, 2 times 10 to the 5. Uh, I showed you previously from Cromer's, we got 4 times 10 to the 5. Um, and since we've actually validated this experimentally, we can use this as a measure of the diffusion coefficient. We just turn it around, and because we've measured this directly, and pull out the diffusion coefficient. And in this case, we get 3.6. 3 um, so the average is like 3.5. And, um, and they're all, this is, this is actually excellent agreement for, for experiment, experimental results. This is telling us that actually um, the folding dynamics that we are looking at, I mean, we're looking at these folding dynamics now over uh, timescales that range from 10 microseconds up to, you know, um, hundreds of milliseconds. So this is four orders of magnitude of timescales. And the diffusion coefficients we're getting from looking at that time scale, all, all these different timescales, they're all agreeing pretty nicely, which is saying that this 1D diffusional, one, one diffusion model is actually working remarkably well. All right, now we can of course do this for other hairpins and we have a whole collection of hairpins in our lab. Uh, and so we were interested in whether there might be some dependence of the results on the sequence. And in particular on uh, the GC content. So as you know, ATs are weaker than GCs. So uh, yeah, um, anyway, we made a series of, of hairpins with varying GC content. And then in one of them, so, so in the, this one, this one, this one, this one, the the, the sequence is random. There's no distrib particular distribution. In this one, you can see we've grouped most of the GCs down at the bottom there to actually shape the barrier a bit. Uh, so for each of these hairpins, we did what I showed you for the previous one, right? We measure this distribution of individual transit times. Here I'm blowing up the long time because, of course, that's the one that's most interesting for the diffusion coefficient. And so this is the result you get for all GCs, and this is the result you get for all ATs. 
Uh, and then we extract the average time. We calculate the diffusion coefficient in two ways, one from the average time and then one from this fit. Okay, and then we can just plot that as a function of the GC content. And we f what we find is that for four of the hairpins, it's on a very nice straight line. Um, so it seems that as you increase the GC content, it gets faster. Um, one of them is anomalous, and this is the one where we shaped the barrier. And of course, this actually makes sense, right, because the average time varies inversely as the barrier stiffness. So if I make the barrier stiffer, I'm going to make it go faster. And that's precisely what we did here. We made it stiffer. Um, this is actually also telling you that this transition time is not really the fundamental thing you should care about. It's the diffusion coefficient. So if we go and plot the diffusion coefficient as a function of GC content from those two different methods, it's a nice straight line, very linear dependence. And in fact, we can even add on that longer hairpin, and it fits right where it should. Um, so this is telling us that uh, for some reason, the GC base pairs have a diffusion coefficient that's almost twice as fast as AT base pairs, um, which presumably has something to do, you know, there's some extra, uh, the, the barriers for the bond rotations are uh, higher for um, ATs than they are for GC. And this also means that, in principle, you should get a position dependence of the diffusion from this, from this sequence dependence. Right? Okay. Um, another little piece of physics that we can do here is that uh, the transition times, the average transit times, should be related to the rates by these equations here. This is work that Gerhard Hummer did a little while back. Um, and of course, we can measure each of these quantities. Uh, and we can do it se separately for the unfolding rate and also for the folding rate. Um, so we calculated the predicted transit times from the rates um, at different forces where it, has it spends different amounts of time in the, different in the two states so that the, these probabilities vary. So I plotted this as a function of unfolded state probability. So that's what you get for the unfolding rates, this is what you get for the refolding rates, and then that was the measured time. So it agrees very nicely. Uh, okay. Um, so and, and this was over about an, uh, a bit over, it was about a factor of 20, I think, in rates uh, that we could measure. Uh, all right, so this was all hairpins. I mean, hairpins are a lovely model system, but of course they're a lot less complicated than, than proteins. And so we wanted to do the same kind of thing with proteins. Um, unfortunately, as we had seen from Bill Eden's work, the times in proteins were likely to be uh, at or below our time resolution, right? On 1 to 10 microseconds is... is uncomfortably close to our the resolving power of our instrument. So this suggested that we should look for something that was slow. And as I talked about earlier, this misfolded prion dimer has very slow diffusion coefficient. So it's a thousand times slower than the native folding, which suggests that the transition time should also be a thousand times slower. Um, and this means that instead of being on the microsecond time scale, it should be on the millisecond time scale. And that ought to be very easy to measure. And indeed, when we did some constant force measurements, uh, you can see these transitions where it just sort of moseys along there, and you see the time scale there is one millisecond. Um, so we can do the same kind of analysis. You pull out a bunch of transitions. You can see a wide variety of paths and uh, path shapes and times. Uh, we can pull out the uh, distribution of unfolding times and refolding times. Again, it's time reversal symmetric with an error. Uh, and we can measure the average, so in this case it's half a millisecond. We can get the diffusion coefficient that's implied by that value. Uh, it's 2,000 nanometers squared per second. Recall that the one we got from Kramer's was 1,000, so it's in good agreement. And then we can fit the distribution to that, that theory that I showed you before and pull out another value of the diffusion coefficient, and again, it actu it's actually in between these two values. So just as for the hairpins, even, even though this is a much more complicated system, right, this, misfolded, this misfolding transition, um, we're still f seeing that these numbers are all very consistent right, across all these timescales. Uh, and th this is suggesting that you know, 1D diffusion as a model is still pretty darn good at, at, at explaining what we're seeing. Now, this does raise a really good question, which is why and should it be the case, right? I mean, this is an ex you know, one, a one-dimensional projection of that n-dimensional landscape where n might be hundreds or thousands. That's a rather extreme simplification. Um, and th there's an even 
you know, an even more basic question is that we don't know whether um, extension is a good reaction coordinate. You know, are we capturing the full dynamics on the whole landscape just by looking at this one rea this one dimensional reaction coordinate? Um, now, theory has made a number of theory papers have made suggestions for how to choose good reaction coordinates, mostly in the context of of simulations, where you actually have the ability to choose a reaction coordinate. Um, and simulations have shown that 1D projections um, can indeed predict the kinetic properly, properties properly, which, which says that one, a 1D de description can be good. It's not necessarily good, but it can be good. Um, but of course, experimentalists, we don't get to choose the reaction coordinate. That's imposed by the method that you're using to follow the folding. Um, yet, I mean, regardless of that, we still e interpret the, exp the data in terms of a 1D theory. Uh, almost universally. Uh, now there's been a little bit of testing of for self-consistency to show that the rates in a 1D description at least are self-consistent, right? I talked about this experiment doing that and there's been other work too, like by Bill Eaton and others. Um, but it turns out that like we were, we were able to find very few papers where they were actually looking at the quality, of testing the quality of the reaction coordinate for an experiment. Um, so we thought we should do this. Um, and we decided to do this using the by looking at the statistics of the transition pass. So this is this method that uh, Paul talked about last week, looking at the conditional probability for being on a transition path as a function of where you are on the reaction coordinate. Uh, and so that is given by this expression here. This is just simply a statement of Bayes' theorem, right? Uh, but the nice thing is that each of these three quantities is experimentally measurable. So. This here is just my overall extension probability distribution. This is th that the extension probability distribution for just the part of the trajectory that's on a transition path. And then this is just the fraction of time I spend on a transition path. Uh, so, uh, oh, and uh, as, as Paul had said, you have a good reaction coordinate when uh, this conditional probability is highly peaked at a value of a roughly a half right near the barrier. Okay, so we can go and, say, take our favorite hairpin, uh, you know, calculate the probability distribution, pull out the transition pass, calculate their probability dis distribution, and then calculate what this conditional probability is. And we find it is nicely peaked, but uh, it's, well, not anywhere close to 0.5. So naively, this would say, oh, this must be a terrible reaction coordinate. Except, of course, we have to remember that our, our distributions are strongly affected by the compliance, right? They get broadened. Um, and so we need to correct by replacing the distributions with the, the deconvolved distributions. And when you do that, you find that your uh, conditional probability is now uh, peaked you know, right near the barrier, and it's about 0.4 something, rather, 0 0.42, 0 0.43. Um, so that's saying that, yes, it is a, a good reaction coordinate. Um, but there's, we can actually go further. There's this, this interesting result, which is that this conditional probability, if you have ideal one-dimensional diffusive behavior, it should be related to the splitting probability I was talking about earlier via this relation here. Um, so as you know, we can just calculate the, the splitting probability and we can compare. Um, and again, it agrees, I think, quite well for, for given experimental errors, right? It's, it's okay, it's slightly shifted by about a nanometer or so, but you know, that's within error. Uh, we can do the same thing for a different hairpin with a different kind of landscape, and again, you see it agrees pretty nicely. Uh, so this is telling us that, this is yet another piece of evidence telling us that hairpin folding does seem to be, you know, well described by ideal 1D di diffusion over those m landscapes that we, in fact, measured. Um, now, you know, the, on the only snag here is that uh, hairpins it's perhaps not so surprising that a 1D model would work very well because this is really a one-dimensional topology, right? It's just like a zipper. Uh, so a much more um, uh, stringent test would be to apply it to proteins. So we can do this to our PRP data, uh, pull out the transitions and calculate that conditional probability in black. You can see it's peaked, in this case, it's uh, 0.43, very near the barrier. So it suggests that again, for this protein, the end-to-end extension is, an, is a good reaction coordinate. Um, and we can do the same thing about calculating this, this, uh, this function here of the, of the splitting probability, and it agrees very nicely. Uh, so, you know, once again, I think we're seeing really 
su surprisingly good quantitative agreement with one-dimensional diffusion over the measured landscape. All right. Now, another approach we can take um, is to uh, compare the p-fold that we calculate from the landscape that we measured, right? so that's like using this expression here, to the p-fold that we get empirically from the trajectory. And they should agree if, because this, this calculation is based on the assumption that you have one dimension diffusion. Um, so you, know, you should only get good agreement if this is actually a good approximation. So that's the, uh, the splitting probability we get directly from the trajectory, and that's what we get from the reconstructed landscape. And again, I mean, as we know from the previous one, it, it should work out, right? Because those two methods are really complementary. Um, so yet again, right, more evidence that that ideal 1D diffusion is works remarkably well. We don't seem to need anything more. Okay, so with that, I guess I will, I will end. I've shown you how we can reconstruct these free energy profiles from um, actually several complementary uh, methods and then combine those with measurements of the kinetics to extract diffusion coefficients. I've shown you how you we can measure transition paths. So measure the motions through the transition states directly, uh, which actually gives us a very sensitive new probe of, of landscapes and diffusivity. And finally, I've shown you how we can use some of these measurements to test reaction coordinate and like, look at the, at, uh, and validate this diffusive model of folding. Um, and so then I'd like to thank all of the uh, cast of characters who did the work, uh, especially uh, my postdoc Krishna, uh, my student Noel, who have been, they've been doing the transition path work. Uh, Hal led the, um, led the uh, prion work. Uh, along with Derek, um, and Ajay did a lot of the p-fold work, and then Daniel and Megan uh, did uh, the a lot of the landscape reconstruction work, um, and Allison did a lot of the um, alpha synuclein work. Oh, <laughs> yeah, okay. And then thanks to the theorists who have helped us work through some of these ideas, and of course all of the uh, funding agencies who made it possible. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>